Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business podcast, where we talk to interesting people about life and business. We cover their backgrounds, obstacles they've encountered, and find out what drives them. Along the way, our guests share nuggets you can use to drive your success. Reach me directly, D-A-M-O-N at ExitYourWay.us, or check out our website, ExitYourWay.us, for more information. I hope you enjoy our show. All right, everyone, welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka, and I have a special guest for you today. And can you guess, the person that talks about e-commerce and manufacturing almost any day, we have a guest today in Neil Twa who has sold over $100 million in Amazon FBA products. He's been helping people launch brands on FBA for nearly 10 years. And I am so excited to have you here today, Neil. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it, Damien. Yeah. So it's it's great to have an expert like you on today that that has lived lived the life for a while on e-commerce. And and as we talked uh, prior to getting on, you really started out in e-commerce right out of college. So can you give us a little bit of your background and really tell us about? kind of your journey to where you've got to helping people launch yeah. brands on Amazon. Sure. I'll FBA. try to keep it under like three minutes and save this stuff that maybe nobody yeah. cares about except my mom. Uh, yeah. At the end of the day, very simple. As you mentioned, college, I, I went to college on a full ride music scholarship, uh, classical and music and jazz. And in my third year, I realized I was going to die in a van down by the river, not really making any money. I was watching the internet come out, Pentium computers, all this really cool stuff. And I, I was looking at my professors and I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this? And they're like, we can't teach you any of that. I'm like, I want to learn e-commerce. They're like, we don't, we can't do anything about online commerce. Yeah. I'd actually yeah, started yeah. a little website called the bargain guys, uh, where we were doing inner, you know, eBay style swapping through the website on the campus. Okay. Um, so I had already kind of got my hooks into that and thought that would be fun. So I switched to business computer science for all of a semester and realized that was a horrible thing. They wanted to teach me like Fortran and COBOL and server mainframes. And I was going to yeah. die in front of a green screen. And I'm like, this is yeah. not cool. And I met a guy who said, you know what? You should get into this programming called ASP and, and stuff. It's a dynamic server pages and all this crazy cool stuff. And I'm like, great. How do I do that? And he's like, well, you dump out of college and go to the corporate world. And I'm like, oh, OK. Uh, it turns out he worked for Sprint in Kansas City. And I said, OK, well, let me see what you can do. Uh, so I started to go consulting, got out in the corporate world, eventually worked my way into Sprint Supply Chain as a contractor, learned how to do programming, built knowledge base, their first knowledge base on Sprint Local Supply Chain, uh, which led me into Sprint PCS right as the first mobile phone, the brick phone uh, yeah. was going to market. I was like the 5,000th employee. Uh, when I left Sprint after helping them launch their first ever knowledge base implementation project, there was 80,000 employees and 25,000 reps. It was enormous growth, amazing time to watch that company just explode into the mobile market, which was really just every chance you get to do something. It was innovation. It was upgrade. It was new, new, new promotions. It was just like everybody was on the cutting edge of everything. Yeah. Uh, IBM had a project with Sprint once they got evolved. Uh, and the partners came in and were doing this project, et cetera. And I was helped leading it. And they said, Hey, you know what? You're doing this pretty well. Why don't you come do this for IBM? I said, okay. So they flew me out to our monk and they said, Hey, you're an IBM -er now. I'm like, cool. Um, so it, it literally was the epitome of being the dumbest guy in the room full of a bunch of smart people. Cause by the time I got to IBM and I had uh, based, uh, all over the country, all over the world, yeah. I was, I was flying all the time. Uh, the guys that I was working with are double docs and MIT and Yale, and they had these degrees in human interaction, machine language learning, and they were building these semantic engines and they were working on the Watson computer and we were doing knowledge management and all this crazy stuff. And I was just like, I felt like the dumbest guy in the room. Yeah. Um, but they were just, they were super smart, taught me a lot. Um, that led me to realizing finally that I, I had an opportunity come up in 2007 to kind of leave that corporate and kind of say what to do next. You know, I didn't want to move to Argentina with my division. What did I want to do? I said, this is my chance, you know, let me take this and go. And so I started my own business consulting division. Uh, through that process, I worked in the oil and gas industry. I worked in big tech and manufacturing at like uh, Cummins and Columbus. I got to be, you know, my team led the 2010 census project for IBM uh, as a contractor. So I got to do a lot of really fun things. Realized that at some point I needed to get back to what I felt was my core, what I had started out doing, and that was internet 
Uh, and so I started into affiliate marketing lead generation for companies. I got really good at it. I got companies to be able to grow exponentially. They got series A funding off the back of my efforts. And then it dawned on me one day, I should be making the products that I'm helping these people scale. It was like that moment of epiphany. It was like that corner, yeah. that why in the road. I'm like, geez, you got to change. Uh, so as I was doing that, a friend literally popped up and said, hey, did you know you could sell on Amazon? I'm like, really? That's interesting. Because uh, I was a traffic guy, all about traffic leads. Yeah. And I was like, well, how do I get traffic leads and acquisitions for physical products as I've been doing already? Can I do it for my own brand? And he said, why don't you take a look at Amazon? They have this thing called Fulfilled by Amazon, FBA. Uh, it was just a company that got purchased by Amazon to help them fulfill yeah. their infrastructure. Okay. Uh, operational independence was a really cool component of things I'd done in the past. That's the beauty of the internet. Um, upside scalability is brand new. You could sell products. So we started to test it. Um, realizing that a lot of my engineering background and stuff from IBM and the business side and the technical side were playing a role because Amazon's a giant search engine for products. Uh, and it was like, well, products are being displayed in the pages. How do we get our products to go to number one? And how do we get them to be on the top pages? And how do we get more people to see our products? And we spent a better part of two years figuring that out. Uh, and once we kind of learned that component by 2012, we were launching our own branded products in Amazon and literally mm -hmm. every product we launched, it would just race up to the top and sales would go. And, you know, fast forward, people were asking us what we were doing. Three years later, we had eight brands going. Uh, we were just absolutely going crazy. Um, so we started to coach people who wanted to know what we were doing. Um, started to consult with them. We got to make other people successful, which turned out to be fun because we really enjoyed that. My partner and I uh, started collaborating in 2012. Uh, his name's Reed Larson, super smart guy. He was a CFO of a $100 million company. He had left that venture and decided, what do I want to do next? Uh, we joined forces. He's my right-hand tactical logistics operational CFO uh, and COO operator. I'm the CFO, more the operator at the top end uh, of this. Uh, and I said, you know, let's partner together on that side of the marketing and business. And so we've stuck together for eight years now. Nice. Uh, and we've launched many products, thousands of customers, made over 20 people millionaires um, on the Amazon platform, selling their own physical branded products. And that's what we've been doing. We de also developed a software and a mentorship. And uh, now we're into acquisitions. Now uh, through our company Voltage, um, we have multiple holdings. One mm -hmm. of them is portfolios where we actually uh, are now acquiring uh, these companies. We have investors deploying uh, 15 million in capital a quarter. Uh, to start purchasing these um, companies into our portfolios for a 36 month exit uh, once we start to getting these brands within our control. So we've yeah. moved to the whole end of it from the very beginning of launching a brand all the way through exiting a brand. Well, it uh, is it is interesting because you've pulled the whole thing together and 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 there's a couple things behind this too, but it, sure. it's it's interesting and, and I'll get to the other things too. But it is interesting because you started out figuring out the marketing on the Amazon platform with Correct. FBA to really be able to get the listings. Uh, you know, it's got to be a good product and everything, but you get That's the right. listings to get get the attention and get where they need to be and then drive the sales that way. That's but right. you've, you've brought this full circle with now you're helping these people build these brands and being a financial partner alongside of them because in businesses, and you see this every day as you launch brands, cash is king and you can, you can literally, your demand can run you out of cash uh, faster than you know, if you're, if you're growing quickly on e-commerce. Yeah. We have a saying saying revenue is uh, vanity, um, profit yeah. is sanity and cash flow is king, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and these businesses are cash flowing uh, monthly, weekly, quarterly. Uh, we build great products, as you mentioned, that have great profitability in them, that build profitable brands. And of course, they build a big P&L that's profitable, too, uh, in mm -hmm. the business model. And that is one of the things that's really matured uh, in the last eight plus years that we've been doing this. Uh, as we talked to a lot of people about brand building, many people have tried to do other things, drop shipping. They've tried to play around with Amazon, thinking that they could just throw up a listing and magically make it sell. Uh, and that's not quite how it works, especially in more of the competition that we've seen uh, you mm -hmm. know, Amazon was a two lane highway when we started. It's a seven lane highway now. Yeah. Uh, so things are a little bit different. Um, not, you know, 80 percent still the same, but that 20 percent can be a really big struggle for uh, for business yeah. or for people or whatnot who don't really understand what Amazon wants you to do uh, with the system and how they want you to play with it. People are typically fighting with it and they don't even realize they're fighting with it. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So what what do you think? You know, someone say I've got a product, say I uh, I've 
doing okay, but I really haven't tried Amazon FBA. What are some yeah. of the things that people can see if they if they moved into the FBA and and really embrace that and do it right? I mean, because yeah, volume is one thing. Sure. But what are what are what does the F what does FBA really give them in terms of market advantages, strategic advantages, some other things that Absolutely. you see when you when you put a put a brand into the, the FBA ecosystem? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind uh, in, in the answer to that question. It's it, the product itself. If, if you're selling a product, a widget today in this world, unless you're an inventor who has a patent on that particular product, you will find there's a lot of competition already in the market. And if it's something you're selling and while it's uniquely yours and you even may have brand trademarks on it, there are competitors in Amazon selling products just like that already. Uh, so we call it found money on Amazon, because if you're not selling, someone else is finding that money instead of you. Uh, if you don't have a presence, I analogize it back to the days that go back to my history for a second. Uh, at once upon a time, if you didn't have a yellow pages, you weren't a legit business. Then it was, if you didn't have a website, you weren't a legit business. And now if you're selling e-commerce of any kind or physical products and you don't have an Amazon, many consumers are not literally seeing you as, as legitimate. Uh, there's an equation we like to use in our company called similarity plus familiarity equals trust. And so while there's brands developing uh, products within there and becoming familiar to the consumers on FBA, uh, there's a similarity to those products typically um, because, again, they're not necessarily inventions. They're innovations uh, on products within the marketplace. And, of course, Amazon's trust comes into play. Mm -hmm. So as people are moving products in there, there's a trusted buyer group of people purchasing products probably just like yours. Uh, only they're not finding yours. And yeah. what ends up happening is with well, a lot of off- uh, Amazon or even uh, off uh, market if they're not like selling in online anywhere, uh, any dollars marketing or whatever they're doing is ending up online somewhere. And a lot of times it's ending up on Amazon to validate that this is a legitimate business, legitimate company, legitimate product. And if they decide it's easier to get it, if they can get it in two days with Prime, they're going to order it from Amazon uh, yeah. and it's going to show up. So if you're doing any of those activities off here, marketing, retail, et cetera, even on your own website, if you're attempting to do the social media traffic, et cetera, uh, people are ending up on Amazon. Uh, we know some of our clients that run over a million dollars in ad spend per month are seeing up to 18% of that ad spend end up on Amazon and be per and purchasing someone else's business, uh, yeah. someone else's product. So again, we call it found money. Um, so to get it on there is literally to find money, add value to your channel, and if your purpose is exit, it obviously adds points onto the bottom line uh, for your exit potential when you have multiple channels selling your products. Yeah. Um, so there's really no reason not to do it. It just has to do with how you do it. Yeah. Well, the one thing that you brought up when and we to, today and when we talked before about this is legitimacy. Yes. And and having your products even not on FBA, but if you're not on Amazon at all and you're trying to sell your stuff off your own website and that's the only place you've got it, the legitimacy that you will have by being able and selling your product on Amazon along with your own website is something that you see a lot. And people are, it if is. they don't can't find you on Amazon, then you, you might be shady or There's whatever. There's some questions, especially if you're not a reputable business that's been around for 10, 20 years or more. Yeah, uh, and has a historical base of customers, long longevity. They're you know a little bit more of a household name, etc. If you just started up in the last three, five, even even roughly ten years or so, uh, and you are not seen as maybe a household brand yet, uh, people are going to find uh, complimentary products on Amazon and they're going to buy them instead. Uh, yeah, it is it, you know Amazon only makes up thirty one percent of all e com sales in the United States. So again, they're not the juggernaut per se, although they do make up a good portion of what feels like a lot of sales, especially in my house, we call it subscribe and spend, yeah, uh, not subscribe and save, <laughs> um, because yeah. there's a lot of products moving to my house uh, every week from Amazon. Um, yeah. But Amazon itself gives you, you know, the ability to go into their marketplace, use FBA that fulfilled by Amazon infrastructure, it's like $15 billion they put into this, and create economies of scale on that platform with automation. So as you send that product to Amazon, it will automate the movement of products to the customers, even the customer support in return, uh, giving you the ability to create and diversify that channel without having to put up a new warehouse or hire yeah. 10 new employees or even get to eight figures and hire 10 employees, right? Um, seven, multi seven, even eight figure companies we built, helped, or we've ran our clients to that level. We'll be operating with you know five people, yeah. uh, of which three of them are virtual assistants. 
yeah. uh, operating in specific you know niches. We even have companies that are uh, are under our control within our managed services, where we have a uh, media person who manages that account. Uh, we call them a general manager, and they do the whole thing for the customer, mm -hmm. uh, manage the whole account. So it creates a really fascinating economy of scale uh, in this business model. One of the things we very much love because we don't have warehouses. We used to. Um, we had a 20,000 square foot warehouse once upon a time. We were truck rolling about 10 trucks a week uh, through the warehouse, had about 12 employees. Um, yeah. so we very much understand uh, the complexity of that and the, the business operations required for that. What we found was operational independence and upside was uh, not uh, not in the same ballpark as running that within Amazon's system of FBA. Uh, yeah. We actually shut that down and moved all of our products into FBA. Uh, got away from that seller type and uh, stayed focused on uh, the opportunity that it is to create those multi-brand, multi-company scaling ability that you can do with an Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about this, do you see, uh, when you talk about building a brand on Amazon, are you talking about a specific product brand? Or are you talking about a brand, say, say I, I'm, I'm Damon, I've got a company, I'm really just, I don't even know. I'm into auto products, you know, yeah. I have the best detailing products across the world and they're not mine. I'm, you yeah. know, I might have a, a name brand here, name brand here, the best I've got my, I'm doing my social thing, but I sell it all on Amazon. Sure. Is that the kind of thing that you see, or is it somebody has to have their own product that they've developed that to really be successful on Amazon? To really take success in the market, to create opportunity, to create upside and automation, to create brand value as well as company value, should you want to sell this or hand it off someday. Mm -hmm. um, building your own brand is really the only way to go. Um, to yeah. get repeat customers, to have them come back and buy additional products. Uh, if you are a distributor and you will see the brands that you're selling are doing very well, there's actually no reason why you can't create your own brand. Uh, and start selling that as one of your own product lines. It's not terribly complex to do. It's what's called private label. Uh, yeah. What you're referring to maybe a little bit more like white label or wholesaling. Yeah. Uh, what we're referring to is full on private label where you're able to brand register it on Amazon as your brand only and then brand trademark that as your unique product. Uh, so if obviously uh, that makes uh, manufacturing uh, yeah. needed, right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, distribution and logistics. Um, but that's not terribly complex to do, uh, especially if you have help doing it. Um, we have sourcing agents all across the world that help us with the manufacturing components. We don't just default to China, uh, mm -hmm. where like so many people think, oh, you get all your products from China. No, actually, we don't. <laughs> we get our yeah. products from a lot of different places. Uh, so we haven't yeah. been affected by tariffs and other things. We also make sure our clients uh, have distributed uh, and backup redundancy in their manufacturing at different locations around the world. Uh, and of course, profitability of those products is very important to build a profitable brand. So again, we'll yeah. build those private label products. We'll ensure that we know the three to five competitors we're going to go head to head with on Amazon and that we're going to beat them at their game and become the dominant brand on Amazon. Even if no one has heard of our brand, we create yeah. brands from scratch all the time and we become the dominant brand. Uh, and it's not brand label. We don't attack things like Nike. We don't go after major brands, if you will, like yeah. Coke. We're yeah. creating our own version. We're creating a Pepsi to Coke. Okay. We're creating a Reebok to Nike. We're going head to head, yeah. but we're with some of these brands, but we're creating brands you probably hadn't heard of yet. Um, and again, that's where that trust and familiarity of that marketplace comes into play. Uh, because again, solution oriented private label products give somebody the opportunity to say, well, this is a problem I'm trying to solve right now. And I'm willing to pay this much to have it solved sooner. Let me give you an example how that works. Um, you have an abscess tooth, Damon, you're hurting the day. You wake up one morning like, dang, this freaking hurts. I need to get into like the doctor. Now I need to get into the dentist. I got to get this fixed. So you call the doctor. You say, when can I get you in? He said, well, I can get you in the next hour for $300. You're like, oh, an hour. I got to wait another hour to 300. He's like, but I can, I can, if you come right now, it'll be $500. I can get this done in 10 minutes. Sold. Yeah. I want to get down there. 10 minutes, 500 bucks, get this tooth out. Let's solve this problem. We look for those opportunities in our private label products to solve those problems in 10 minutes or less for someone who's willing to pay $500 versus waiting an hour for 300. See where I'm going with this? Yep. So with that value perception in our brands, we can take brands and products and switch the narrative just a little bit so people see the value. So we aren't pining over pennies, right? Um, we're not stepping over dollars to pick those pennies up. We're looking for where the dollars and the profit increase and grow, raise our prices, raise our brand affinity, and of course, raise our profits in the process. We build businesses 
that just happen to sell e com <laughs> and we start incubating those products on Amazon to test the brands. Yeah. All right? But we're business builders. So we do mainstream. We do take these products, especially once we acquire them in our portfolio. Uh, I don't think I mentioned this, but one of my business partners in portfolios is Kevin Harrington. He was the original Shark Tank as seen on TV brand guy, infomercial creator, sold over $5 billion in products. When we take a brand into acquisition, it's Amazon FBA uh, and has incubated. Maybe they're doing six, seven, multi seven figures already on Amazon. That's great. That's just showing all upside market potential for this product. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then we can take that brand and we can mainstream it. We can take it to my client who sells a million dollars an hour on QVC. We can take it into the mainstream uh, market, radio, television, infomercials, et cetera. We can make it a household name. Yeah. So that's one of the things we do when we acquire these brands. We look at their stability on Amazon, and then we take them in mass market to make them household names. We go the other direction, which seems odd to some people, because I know a lot of people might be considering going the other way, which is I'm off Amazon. I'm in retail. I'm manufacturing over here, and I want to take products on Amazon, right? Um, we yeah. look at it both ways. Well, and you're using Amazon as your test bed, really, because it's if you can get, yeah, yeah, you have, they have the ad spend, they've got the eyeballs, they've got people looking for the product. 30 I mean, seconds or less, all things to all people in 30 seconds or less. That's the gauntlet Bezos laid down, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what I, what is the traffic on, on Amazon now? Because I'm astounded at it when, when you're doing things on Amazon and how popular a product can really be. It's really surprising to me too. There's like over 125 million Prime subscribers last I looked. Wow. Uh, there are, there's over 200 million in traffic on average every month. That, that bursts over 250 to 300 million during the holidays. Uh, I know that they're doing around 35, I think, million a day, 33 to 35 uh, million a day. Uh, but here's what's more important from our perspective, and that is um, 54% roughly uh, of all of that is third party sellers like us. Yeah. Uh, so about 18, you know, so what is that? I'm doing math in my head. Forgive me. It's uh, 17 to 18 million a day are going to third party sellers like us who are just mom and pop yeah. businesses, small businesses uh, who are putting brands and products out there uh, to the tune of about 18 million a day in opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's cool. We got a few people have been commenting here while we've been on Matthew Perfect. Matthew Perkins. He's asking a few questions, and we can hit sure. those in at the yeah. end or stuff. But he's yeah. he he's wondering if you just work exclusively with Amazon, or do you full full scope with people that are not on Amazon as well? So Voltage is a company I work with. My uh, my company as the CEO, we predominantly work on Amazon first uh, in the FBA channel and build that brand. Yeah. We don't usually we don't ride what I refer to in the country as two horses with one ass. So yep. in portfolios where we have the full senior leadership team, once we acquire that brand from Amazon, uh, I now have a team that will take that brand out to mass market. OK, but we don't do mass market during the incubation phase. And that could be yep. the first 12 to 18 months of that business life uh, on Amazon, incubating the products, proving the brand, uh, increasing the profitability, launching additional products into that brand and building that portfolio up and really shooting for seven figures in 12 months predictably. Uh, as we look at each quarter uh, and then we move into annual sales, each brand has to achieve a certain amount. And with 18 months, it matures. And yeah. then we will take it, uh, either acquire it or if it's our own brand, we'll move it into portfolios and mass market it. OK, really mm -hmm. good. Really good. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, and then uh, we. Yep. Matthew had a couple of questions, but he said those were answered. So thanks oh, a lot. Good. for Nailed doing that new. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nailed it. Right. Nailed it. It's pretty good. There you uh, go. Thanks, Matthew. So, so when you look at this, I mean, it's really interesting to me now because there are, I mean, you guys are acquiring some brands, but there's some bigger groups out there that are acquiring specifically companies that have the majority of their sales on Amazon FBA. That is correct. In the last 18 months, over $6 billion has been deployed to purchase Amazon only FBA business brands. And that is literally in the last 18 months, one of the fastest growing uh, investment vehicles since 99. Yeah. Which well, tells you a lot about where the maturity of this market's going. Cause we're just 18 months into that. Right. Yes. And I, the, the big thing for me is, I, you know, I work with investment buyers almost daily selling other businesses and, and working with the, in those kind of transactions. And the first thing they talk about is, is uh, customer concentration. Yeah. And I always wonder how they get by that 
comfort level of that Amazon is always going to be good for that brand. If I'm acquiring, is it, do you think it's the strategy of I have a whole lot of different products? And if Amazon makes a change, it's only going to affect a few of products, even if they uh, made a pretty significant change in what they're doing that gives the investors comfort in the, in the overall investment or because I mean, you've, in Voltage, you guys are, are raising money and doing the, those kind of things for it too. I, I was just, that was one of my questions, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a, kind of an investment banking question. Yeah. How to, how to look at that. Right. So yeah. in terms of the investment strategy uh, for those, we're doing it a little bit differently. Let me explain the market first and I'll tell you why I think yeah. we're, why we're looking at this a little different. We're innovators, right? As I mentioned originally, uh, I'm a, I've been an inventor. I've got patents yeah. and really cool technology for the wire and gas uh, in the gas oil and gas industry for wireline technologies. Uh, that have to do with transferring data over copper. But at this level, you find that products and opportunities become innovations for products, right? It isn't really the inventor that you see with this really crazy unique product. It's an innovation or a slight twist on an existing product. What oh, you're okay. noticing is these larger aggregators are buying up multiple versions of those brands within these other companies that have been built, uh, creating kind of a larger portfolio. And it's a numbers game. Right. Like Thrasio and others have acquired yep. so much money now. Thrasio is going IPO. Yep. Uh, Aquilo's got 160 million recently uh, at the Prosper show in Vegas. Recently, there was like eight vendors, which is the first time in, in the history of Prosper in Las Vegas. There had been this many vendors who were aggregators. Um, yeah. They are all taking the first arrows in the back. They're the first to market. You know how this goes. We're not even in the early adoption of the bell curve. So they're getting a lot of arrows in the back right now. And one of the things I see we're, we're doing differently against where the market is headed as we're coming in number two, because it's okay to be number two yeah. uh, to market is to watch how they're actually going to be falling. Well, they're not falling apart, but they're running into some major issues with growth. They hadn't necessarily anticipated. And it always happens with early adopters. Yeah. Um, and this is that they are going to have to cut the bottom line off of a, quite a few of those products in order to maintain growth percentages at investor expectations. Yeah. So some line at the CFO level, some brands are going to fall below that. Uh, while acquired, while just trying to pick up market share, while just spending as much capital as the investors want to deploy uh, into this, they are just picking up anything with a yeah. heartbeat. And yeah. so what they're not really doing is making amends with the amount of staff required to do that. Uh, I know for one, in one instance, one of the people shared, um, with a friend of mine who was at Prosper, uh, he told me a story about how one of them came up and said, yeah, we got like 50 people running brand management campaigns in, in what's called sponsored ads on Amazon's uh, buyer traffic network inside of Amazon. Yeah. He said, 50 people, that is insane. He runs a PPC management company and they have no software, no automation. So literally they're just throwing warm bodies at, at this problem, which wow. you and I both know is going to yeah. create some major problems here shortly. Yeah. Um, so as we saw that and as we've been watching the market go for a while now and watching people go, our investment strategy went totally different. It is we're going to establish brands on Amazon that and we're going to look for brands that are established under a certain criteria that has upside independence, operational independence, uh, has mass marketing appeal and potential for household names. So while we're looking for okay. Amazon FBA brands, we also specifically are looking for their ability to go to mass market. Uh, that is an innovation, if you will, in terms of where the Amazon aggregators are go, who are who, yeah. right now, who are specifically focusing on just FBA businesses. Yeah. So we'll even look at businesses that have, say, a Shopify website or other, you know, type of sales, WooCommerce or whatever, who yeah. have a good established potential brand, have maybe tried Amazon or necessarily haven't opened the Amazon channel yet. And our team being the experts they are could quickly deploy that brand into Amazon and open that channel very quickly in the market share and then have a multi-channel opportunity, which is where we're yeah. going to go anyways. Yeah. So we're taking a slightly different version. Our investors like that um, because, uh, number one, they're actually buying the asset directly. So we're almost in a broker relationship in a managed services, yeah. a business outsource or business process outsourcer, if you will, a little bit. Yeah. Um, to borrow corporate terms for anybody who might understand what that means, a managed services yeah. insert, inserting itself into the buyer-seller relationship where we validate at the due diligence level uh, that this company has its you know, market potential upside and mass marketing, it's presented to the investor groups who then determine if they wanna buy that. When they buy it, they're buying it directly from the seller, not from us. So we don't need yeah. to go through all the investment rigmarole, right? Yeah. We provide a due diligence package. It shows the value of this brand, its purchase price, its inventory, its upside for capitalization uh, for go-to-market growth. Uh, once it's acquired, we enter a relationship with them to make it 100% passive for the investor. So it comes into our company and is fully managed by us. Yeah. 
And then yeah. in 12 to you know, 24 and 36 months, we have operational expectations of growth and strategy uh, to take a, an asset purchased at three to four X and return it at four to eight X uh, with the whole portfolio growing and basically double in size in 36 months for a full market exit. Yeah. So we're going after the two channels where the aggregators are only staying on one. And Great I see point. that as a huge opportunity because guess what's going to happen, Damon? We're going to pick up some very good fire sales here in about six to 12 months on brands that were really good, uh, probably a little mismanaged by the larger aggregator yeah. and yeah. have tremendous upside where we'll swoop in for pennies on the dollar and pick those up and then be able to take them to mass market really fast. Yeah. 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 I just the well, and you look at the mass, the the mass the mass buyers yes. of the Amazon and FBA. I mean, they they literally are buying just to deploy capital, uh, in they my are. opinion, because when you look at some of the websites, it's like we can turn turn and burn, you know, 45 days, you can you can have your business sold, you know, right. blah, 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 blah. It's, and, uh, you it's know, a good story. And, <laughs> yeah, 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 but but in the real in the real world, yeah. uh, outside of that, yeah. I mean, deals deals just don't get done that fast if you do a proper diligence. And that's that's what I see is that they they are deploying capital to be deploying capital. And yes, they are going to take some arrows in the back. Yep. It is exciting though how they how they are able to do this because I think that in the future, this this will be much it'll be much more commonplace, obviously, and it'll be more comfortable. Well, it will, this. right? Just go three to four years out. Yeah. We haven't seen capitulation in the market. We haven't seen consolidation of the market yet. Yeah. We haven't seen aggregations between the different brands and various businesses. That's coming as any uh, mm -hmm. curve goes. Uh, we will see that. And what we're planning is a tortoise in the hair race. Yeah. Uh, as we'll see this go along, we're going to see some major uh, changes in the market um, in the next three or four years. And we, we plan to be in part of it. In fact, we'll be aligned to either be purchased by a larger aggregator or even a SPAC yeah, uh, or one of these others, because we plan to go for profits in portfolio, not mass brand acquisition. We're looking at 36 good businesses. Any smart investor knows, obviously, that if you're going to deploy a certain amount of capital, it obviously depends upon the investor's capabilities. I could deploy yeah. 10 million. Uh, someone else can only deploy one. It really gets down to if I could deploy 10 or 20, should I deploy it in one million increments into 10 companies? Because one of those companies, mass market, can make up the rest of the nine yeah. Um, now you're looking at a slightly different structure, and that's kind of how we've approached it with our investors. Um, our acquisitions uh, are going to be between two to five million. Our EBITDA range is between two fifty to one million. So we're actually targeting brands that are very different uh, than those aggregators. Why? Because yeah. we're looking for the uniqueness of those products and brands and the mass marketing appeal where they're not. They need to get to the one million plus EBITDA because it's only Amazon. Yeah. So we don't have to do that. I look at the one that's at 250 EBITDA and I say, well, dang, I can make that a million uh, in, in just Amazon only in the next 12 months while adding on the additional outside mass marketing channel, which could do a million a month. Yeah. Uh, so we look at this very uh, different approach. I only need 36 of those. I don't need 360 of them, which is very yeah. different, and different than the way this is appearing. Well, when you comparatively, right, I'm, yep. I'm an old manufacturing guy, whatever you want to call it. That's that's what I grew up in, and the, and the roll-ups that you saw in those kind of industries many years ago, with people actually understood the industry and, right. and were able to do that. It's very similar to what you're doing, but you're doing it on Amazon and and understanding the Amazon and the mass market. You right. a got the Amazon, which has the traffic, which in e-commerce. That's that's why I. Amazon's such a behemoth with the traffic. I still go back to that. I'm still so that. amazed at it every day. Yep. And you're your real differentiator, as you said, the aggregators, if they don't have the the technology or the capabilities to really understand how to launch brands and grow them on Amazon, they're missing out on the biggest opportunity that really springboards for the other mass market opportunities. Because once you create that, um, um, you, you create that brand knowledge or that brand awareness mm, that you get from uh, from being on Amazon and being popular on Amazon with a, with even a smaller product popular on right. Amazon. Right. That gives you enough to really launch into the mass market, like you said, into the other the other channels where you can really. It really does. And what I've seen in, in my eight plus years of doing this is many sellers on Amazon really don't know what they're doing even yeah. the brand owners. And there's always five points of opportunity that we look at initially with each of these. As we consolidate them into shared services within Voltage, we lower their uh, cost and overhead and increase their profitability relatively fast yeah. uh, by consolidating their bookkeeping, financials, logistics, back end, 
Obviously, cost of goods can be changed through our own manufacturing and redundancies. Uh, they typically yeah. don't have the knowledge and experience to do what we do to turn these around very quickly. Many of them that are maybe doing six figures could easily be doing seven figures, but they lack the capital and the knowledge to get there. And that's yeah. one of the areas where we step in and really help take that out. Uh, so Amazon's a big market <laughs> channel opportunity before we even get to the mass marketing. And having yeah. known Kevin Harrington for over six years, having him come on at the senior leadership level is fantastic. He's brought his son who's helping us with the front end brand marketing and, and product uh, distribution and direct to consumer. Uh, my mm -hmm. partner of eight years reads in there. Our uh, EVP of M&A Laurent is 20 plus years in, in the M&A space. And yeah. we brought in another partner who is a two time uh, Emmy award winning uh, videographer for a show called Success in the City. His name's Brandon T. Adams, um, and he is doing all of our brand mass media uh, videos and forward production. Um, so, again, I feel like the dumbest guy in the room uh, with some very well, similar smart people. Yeah. Well, I say, you, you say that and understand you say that out of out of humility. But but the you know, it's really the team that you've put around you would would arguably uh, go against that. Yeah, that's really. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have plenty of time to argue because yeah. we're all you know type A personalities. Yeah. I, I yeah. like to just think of myself as one of the best cat herd wranglers. I just try to keep them all from like fighting and moving in the right direction. I just, you know, yeah. they're, they're cats in suits that sometimes like that, you know, do this thing. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> doubt like, about like that. Mall. It's gotten good at wrangling people. That's basically what I do. I still the, the uniqueness of what you're doing is 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 really cool to me because the 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 pure power of the traffic in Amazon in in these niche products and then turning them private and private labeling them you know or or and then working on the manufacturing getting that working right using Amazon FBA and their traffic and the and the the technology and the way that they can fulfill and do the customer services really takes a lot of headache out of growing those brands. It really does, because we got a very super smart PPC campaign manager who oversees that, who has a software that helps automate it so he can oversee multiple accounts through the automation of our templates that we've used to grow to eight figures. We basically plug that in and it's all equation by the numbers. There's no emotions in this. It's a business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we run everything by the numbers. And, and so because of that, we can keep it all and keep it small. Uh, and that's yeah. the way we kind of like it, um, because, again, it's it's two different stones. I get the mass marketing appeal of the aggregators. It's kind of like going to Walmart. Right. Yeah. Um, you get the mass appeal. That's great. Sell to the masses, you know, eat with the classes. I get all of this. At the same time, there's always that unique aspect of some of those uh, shops around the corner. Uh, the smaller ones, the price cutters, et cetera, the unique markets, the Trader Joe's. Uh, that actually do very well too and are also very profitable even not at the same size they have a different segmentation i kind of see us being like the trader joe's of amazon's if you will yeah uh yeah. where we're kind of cutting out a segment that's a little different and again early market segment uh while amazon has been around for a long time selling a lot of products uh this new aspect of the model uh, is very unique and it literally has to do with cultural and, and marketing shift um we call it the wealth without wall street move uh, so many investors are looking, where do I deploy my capital? Do I put it into things like infinite banking? Do I stick it into real estate and shareholders? Do I put it into other companies? Do I put it yeah. back in my business? Do I, where do I deploy this capital? Right. And many don't realize that e -com is a really great way to do that. You get both the digital and the physical product aspect of the inventory. Yeah. So when you're buying these companies, while they feel digital, which is a bit of a kind of a brain thing, um, they have physical inventory sitting yeah. in the warehouse. Physical assets is part of that purchase, right? Yeah. Uh, and when people start to realize that, they see it a little more like virtual real estate, like purchasing multi-tenant buildings, which is another way to deploy capital, right? Mm -hmm. um, by deploying multiple into multiple businesses, you obviously get the returns of the the whole portfolio, as opposed to looking at it, you know, just as a one by one basis. Yeah. Um, so we give investors that opportunity to to build into their portfolio multiple brand purchases. They're hundred percent passive. Um, quarterly returns, yearly returns, and of course, an exit opportunity when we mature the whole portfolio. So it's a, yeah, it, it's kind of a wealth without Wall Street move. Where to deploy capital? Yeah, yeah, and I, I can, I was thinking in my head how how it would look differently when you when you have a, uh, you know, a ten million dollar a year company brand that you've built on FBA. I mean, you can literally run that with a few people. Uh, I know a number of people who do that. We do that. It takes about five people. Um, yeah. It's a totally different way. of. And, you know, I always thought that was really weird, Damon. But if you've ever been in the oil and gas industry at all yeah, uh, or around it, have you ever walked into some of the offices in Oklahoma where they're running a billion dollar oil and gas company with like 20 people? 
<laughs> no, right. I, I mean, it seems really weird, but yeah, I've walked into a number of those offices and are like, where is everybody? Like, you know, well, we don't need any more people. Um, yeah. So at different types of times, there's different economies of scale. And, yeah. you know, we realized long ago, building more warehouse or hiring more people uh, is one way to go. It creates its yeah. own problems, its own logistics, its own overhead and its own challenges. And many people discover that in the last 18 months with so much that happened in the world. Um, we can deploy very minor amount of people uh, in contract based growth and percentage of growth positions uh, that incentivize them uh, through their expertise and knowledge and, and ability mm -hmm. to execute on our key objectives. Uh, we can deploy them into very large uh, growth environments. And, and literally even multi seven figures on Amazon is still an incubation period for these brands. Once you take them to mass market, they could be 20, $50 million your brands. Yeah. It is really fascinating talking with you now, Neil, when you think about building these companies like you guys are helping them and building it through FBA, a, because the, the, the risk of scaling is so much less like you would with a normal, as you said, I'm going right. to go out and lease a warehouse and then I have to lease more of them. And, 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 and really anymore. And this is what's kind of the, the dirty secret that people don't want to understand in, in right. e-commerce a lot of times is I can't just have one warehouse anymore. If I really want to be a brand, I have to get my shipping down. And that only, that only uh, comes from having multiple warehouses in the locations where your customers are to get them there in a couple days and, and those it's kind big, of things. Yeah. And you look at that, that, that financial risk and that risk of, of, you know, being in those different locations, you can really do a lot of that with the Amazon FBA model. And you really can. And, we still and deploy it, some of that in the third party logistics. Like well, yeah, yeah. we don't own a warehouse anymore. Um, we use uh, independence on uh, three PLs, third party yep. logistics on each uh, side of each coast. Um, yep. who can deploy those products into Amazon as we need them. So we have kind of a just in time inventory, obviously yep. manufacturing to 3PL to Amazon or directly to Amazon as we have yeah. available space. My business partner is a logistics mastermind uh, and has set this whole thing up in such a way where it's not only doable, but it's coachable, teachable. We get others to understand how to build that for themselves. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any warehouses anymore yeah. uh, to hold any of our products. Yeah, I have I have seen that before in some of our clients where we had them where they had their own their own facilities and used the FBA and that right. is a really that's a very effective way I think to 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 minimize your risk until you know that that facility is really going to pay for itself to have two or three or four. It facilities. is, and you've got to balance out both the market. You know, Amazon grew at sixty percent of the fourth quarter of December twenty twenty. That was a yeah. super hyper growth situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're having more growth to this year uh, than ever before. Uh, where warehousing is getting a little bit limited. They have what's called IPI rules or how much you can send yeah. into your inventory. We used to have billions of units of storage space. Now we have millions. Now that doesn't yeah. sound like a lot, but when you're moving a lot of product, it can be kind of a little bit troublesome. So yeah. we just backed up more of our product into the three PLs and yep. then did it more just in time into FBA to kind of overcome that because we're running like a business, not a side hustle or a hobby. Yeah. business. Uh, yeah. we, we have overcome this, but many are falling out of the marketplace right now, Damon. Quite frankly, oh, there yeah. are holes and opportunities opening in Amazon for many people who don't realize this uh, because many of these companies are falling out. Uh, they simply couldn't keep up the inventory and logistics uh, mm -hmm. in order to ensure product supply and demand was met. Yeah. Uh, and they ran out of inventory. And that's a bad thing to do in Amazon. Um, oh, yeah. You yeah. lose spots, <laughs> you yeah. lose ranking, you lose traffic. Yeah. When you run out of inventory. And so yeah. we've seen that growth uh, come through. And of course, helping to manage our clients through that. Yeah. So, uh, how big of a deal? This is this is a little bit off topic, but not oh, yeah. really. How big of a deal was it when when COVID hit and everybody started buying with e-commerce for you guys managing companies? Was it like you just woke up and it's like, oh, I guess we're not getting sleep 20, for the next six months? Twenty twenty was very different for us than most people. It was like Christmas all yeah. year long. Um, we saw an average of about thirty five to forty percent. Uh, increase in 2020. Um, yeah. For us, it was all upside on the business. Yeah. And I know that sounds very strange and maybe it sounds like being braggadocious in the middle of so much trouble uh, that occurred. But quite frankly, e-com was there to be a support network for many people yeah. uh, who, who couldn't shop or didn't shop previously or couldn't travel or couldn't go to the local store anymore. 
Yeah. Um, you know, never having got on it before they got on it for the first yeah. time. My parents were one of them, right? Yeah. Uh, not wanting to purchase on Amazon. Now you can't get them off their cell phones where they're clicking and buying stuff on Amazon and getting it shipped now yeah. <laughs> to their house. Uh, that was a pivotal change. And I think yeah. a lot of that adoption in 2020 is what's occurring with what we're seeing on Amazon now. Uh, in fact, one of the first companies, it was an original Amazon uh, brand called Anchor, is about to be the first one to go IPO completely on Amazon FBA. Wow. Uh, and that's one of the things that's trend setting and what Amazon sees in its brand building and why it's increasing its brand building capabilities. It's increasing its people and manpower to support brands. It's giving the ability to do things they've never let us do, like send direct email broadcast to our sellers, uh, buyers, excuse me, uh, inside of Amazon, um, new targeting options for brands. Yeah. Uh, new brand referral programs that give us the ability to take off Amazon traffic from websites, social media, et cetera, and monetize it against our own brands by sending that traffic back through our own brand link, earning up to five to 30% uh, in referral fees for ourselves, uh, which that's was never cool. before, opening a new era of off Amazon marketing. Yeah. Uh, that's been sort of a weird area for the last eight years plus when they never let us do that. We had some ways to do it that was sort of, sort of great, yeah. but we tried to keep it as wide as possible. But they're really sh showing that brands are where they want to go. And that's where the market meets its opportunity, no doubt. And so e-com has really exploded in the last 18 months. We saw it. Now there's a dip. We saw a dip this year. Um, we saw it the first quarter and stuff come back down. You know, but you have to rationalize those numbers and reconcile them from 2019 forward. Uh, if you saw 20%, 25% uh, growth in 2019, uh, you saw 40%. Now that you're only seeing another 20%, you lost 20%. You know, if you're still ahead or on average from 2019, you're about on pace. Yeah. Uh, so the numbers look a little weird, <laughs> frankly, uh, if you were to look at the PLs on these companies. Yeah. Um, but they're yeah. averaging above uh, where they should be. Um, but we typically see 63% growth in our brands every year over year organically, which is why we love the brand building component. As we get more people and you get consumables, they buy in three months or two months or one month. Um, they subscribe and save to your products and it creates quite an interesting business model. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. And that, that what, what you saw in your businesses is what we saw with clients as well as, you know, you yep. got that 35 to 50% growth just because yep. of the, the, the spike and the increase in spending. And, and then we have some clients too, that do some of the, the, the safety kind of products. And that was a real, you know, the, the supply chain was, was so crazy. And it, honestly, a lot of them just quit selling, we just pull all the listings down across all the platforms because you can't, you know, if you, if you, it was, it was literally, you could, you could get a, a, you know, containers, multiple containers of products in and it wouldn't yeah. last four hours kind of thing. If you, right. if you weren't, you know, so it was yep. pretty hairy in those times, but yeah, it's interesting now as, as we see some of the brands, uh, we're working with are continuing to to grow the multi-channel brands and stuff uh but you're right it's it's at a much slower pace in the last year and 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 rightly so so yeah yeah still tremendous upside oh yeah yeah uh, i mean this, see. this is the thing because do, do you think i i go back to i go back to 2020 yep accelerated the e-commerce buyers yep by years and, and that's all. And, and it's not going to come back. I don't think, I mean, I look at myself, right. I I've, Hey, I help people on Amazon and other platforms and do different things. Not the way you guys do it, obviously, but when, when we're doing the, the M and A and the other kind of work we're doing to help them grow in their multi channels. But even, even me doing that much, I found myself in my family with, with boxes from Amazon and other places on our doorstep almost every day. And All that time. hasn't, that, that, yeah. And that hasn't stopped really. No, you know? I, like I said, I call it subscribe and spend in my house. I have a bunch yeah. of in my house. Uh, the yeah. women, you know, is the biggest demographic on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, makes up like 80% of their sales. And so many of them who couldn't go shopping, retail, other places during that time frame turned online. And yeah. they just, they knew Amazon was there. Maybe they didn't use it as much or whatnot. Uh, and they became a bigger adoption of that, right? And you know, what's interesting, you asked about the future earlier and, and I kind of forgot until just this moment, um, Bank of America and Forrester Research did an e-commerce prediction last year on where they saw the model changing. Uh, talk about flexing their muscles, right? Uh, they said by 2030, they predicted uh, that up to uh, $23 trillion was going to move from the retail online uh, offline uh, into the online. Um, so mm -hmm. the sales channels are changing. 
yeah. the determination is when you want to get involved. Do you want to get involved in three years when it's harder or right now when it'll be easier? Um, yeah. That's the decision from a strategic perspective. If you were involved in it in 2019, you would have rode a pretty good wave last year. Yeah. Um, so every year people are waiting as they, as I talk to them, I'm telling them don't wait any longer. Like you yeah. need to get moving on this. Yeah. Uh, it's a big opportunity to get e-commerce out there and, and truly get in front of people who are buying products. That's, that's the opportunity, right? That's for sure. That's for sure. Well, Neil, it's been awesome talking to you, man. I, I just, I, I am, I am blessed to be able to listen to you and get to be able to ask you the questions because your knowledge flows and, and, and you've done this with these brands and helped them a lot. And so if someone wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. I mean, we can make it pretty simple. You just go to voltagedm.com. Okay. Um, on my website's information, there's a very good a case study video you can check out. Um, there's okay. information on how to text me after you sign up for the free training and just take a look at what we do and investigate it a little bit farther. And if it makes sense, you'll talk directly to me because I don't mess around Yeah. Uh, with people. I'm only looking for those who are very serious about building businesses with a potential exit. Very good. Very good. Well, thanks so much. Thanks everyone for listening today. I have Neil Twa from Voltage, uh, Voltage Holdings. I always forget there's Voltage Holdings uh, on with us today talking about building Amazon brands on FBA. And then if those brands are successful, they're taking those brands into the mass market opportunities and how he's helping people do that today and some of the technical aspects of it. And I just appreciate you so much, Neil, for coming and sharing that because there's a lot of people that are thinking about e-commerce or on e-commerce, but ha don't get to listen to people like yourself. Just talk about this and, and share the information. So thanks so much for being here today. Well, thank you. I'm honored. I appreciate your time here and uh, spending some time with your listeners today. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks once again for joining us. We'll be back again next week with more guests talking about life and business.